In today's game, Tal makes a very strange decision in a world championship match. Perhaps the strangest decision in an opening of a world championship match ever. This is game three against Botvinnik, uh, a very compelling match. And this opening is the Karo Khan, but watch how Tal makes some strange decisions, not necessarily good decisions, but he's able to use that psychologically to put his opponent under a lot of pressure. Let us jump right in. Tal begins with e4, and Botvinnik plays c6, the Karo Khan, a positional and solid system. Uh, Tal plays knight to c3, which indicates he's probably going to play the two knights, which he does after d5 knight to f3, and bishop to g4. And in this position, what happens is black usually captures on f3, gives white the bishop pair, but then tries to create a light squared uh, structure with his pawns and create a position that's favorable for knights. After h3, bishop takes knight. The almost automatic response is queen takes f3. But here, Tal plays a move that shocked, really, the, the whole chess world. He took with the G pawn, intentionally uh, doing damage to his own pawn structure. Now, there could be some potential dynamic play with these F pawns, uh, and recently there have been some grandmaster that, grandmasters that have experimented with this, uh, but the truth is, then and now, it probably is not the best decision. But it definitely threw Botvinnik on his back foot, and now he's got to think over the board his preparation isn't going to do him much good. He plays e6, continuing the plan of creating a light squared wall with his pawns. Tal plays d4. Tal's logic is, I have the bishop pair, I want to gain space, I want to open the position for those bishops. Knight to d7, Botvinnik knows that to take advantage of this structure, he needs to keep the position locked and uh, activate his knights uh, in the position. Here Tal plays bishop to f4. He would later say that he thought the bishop maybe belonged on e3, keeping the d4 pawn defended. Botvinnik plays bishop to b4, pinning the knight, of course, but also the potential of uh, moving this bishop back to c7 to challenge Tal's bishop on f4 and try to eliminate that bishop pair was also a possibility. Tal plays h4, gaining space on the king side, but maybe he should have moved a piece instead. Knight g to f6 from Botvinnik. And here, e5 was played by Tal. Uh, a3 was another option. Uh, but after taking, takes queen f3, uh, f5. Here, black is clearly better. He has a pawn, and the knights are beginning to get control of these, uh, these light squares. Uh, so because of that, Tal plays e5, gaining a tempo. But remember, he has the bishop pair. He'd rather not lock up the position. So this move definitely favors black's knights. Botvinnik plays knight to h5 to harass the bishop at f4. The bishop goes to g5, hitting the queen. The queen goes to a5. Now, of course, he's threatening to take the knight on c3. So the bishop returns, and now queen to b6. A very irritating square for a tile in this position. The queen hits d4 and has some x-ray pressure on the b2 pawn. So a3 is played by a tile to kick the bishop. The bishop goes to e7. And now bishop to e3 to defend the d4 pawn. Now he is hanging his b2 pawn, but if Botvinnik uh, takes that, then knight to a4, this is a very old trap, and one of the reasons why b2 is often a poisoned pawn, this queen is now completely trapped here. It has nowhere to go. These bishops control, this bishop controls this square, and the knight controls g6. So the queen would be trapped. So instead, Botvinnik plays g6 with the idea of maybe playing knight h5, g7, f5 to put that knight in a more centralized square. Knight to a4 hits the queen. The queen goes back uh, to d8. A very interesting variation, by the way, is the if he plays queen to a5, uh, hitting the knight while delivering check and trying to force that knight back to c3, why can play queen to d2 with this idea? If Botvinnik takes the knight, then b3. And it looks like the queen is trapped. It has nowhere to go. But black has a really cunning way of getting out of this. He can play this amazing move, bishop to b4. Taking advantage of the fact that there's a pin down the a-file, and he's pinning uh, the queen to the king. Uh, and remember, white's down a piece here, so if he just takes the piece back, that's no big deal. 
But c3 hits uh, the bishop and the queen both at the same time. And after queen b3, uh, cb4, in this position, black is definitely better uh, for sure. So he doesn't go down that route, though. He plays the queen to d8, aiming, of course, at this h4 pawn. Queen to d2, and here knight to g7. He doesn't take the pawn just yet. The knight is heading to f5. If he takes the h pawn, it, it creates complications. Why create complications when you're winning positionally? Bishop to g5, offering the exchange of those uh, bishops, those dark squared bishops. But here, Botvinnik plays a very strong move. He plays the move h6, which is a pawn sacrifice, or at least it appears to be at first. After bishop takes h6, now knight to f5. Hitting that bishop, but it regains the pawn because there's no way Tile can play bishop to g5 because of the pin down the h file. Uh, Botvinnik can just take twice on g5 and then white would lose the rook at h1. So because of that, that bishop is forced to a more passive square, f4, and now rook takes h4, and Botvinnik gets his pawn back. Rook takes h4, knight takes h4. So now we have some tactics in the position. Botvinnik is threatening knight to f3 check, which would for fork the king and the queen. Um, and there's some real cool tactics here. Queen to e3, black can play this dastardly move. Bishop to g5 to exchange more pieces. It looks like black is losing a piece here, but he is not. After bishop takes, black can actually take with his queen. After queen takes, queen knight to f3 check would fork the king and the queen, leaving black in a much superior uh, position. And if uh, the bishop goes to e2 to defend that pawn, then knight to, d, the knight to g2 check, and uh, white loses the bishop pair. So instead, Tal is not worried about the f pawn, and he goes ahead and castles long. It says, you can have that f pawn if you want. After knight f3, queen to e3, knight h4, um, bishop h3, queen to a5, bishop g5, Tal would be threatening to draw the king into the middle of the board with bishop takes e7. For example, the black takes the knight, then bishop takes bishop, king takes bishop, and queen to g5 check, hitting the knight and the king. After king e8, queen takes h4. This is an equal position, and since Tal is worse, he would be fine with uh, an equal position. So instead of uh, knight takes f3, Botvinnik plays b5. He starts his own attack against white's king now on the queen's side. Now Tal made a logical conclusion here, which is that he can't play passively. He has to take advantage of his bishop pair and the fact that Botvinnik's king is still in the middle of the board. He has to do something. He can't just let black uh, roll him over. So he plays knight to c5, which is a pawn sacrifice, uh, and Botvinnik takes that pawn. Knight takes e c5, bishop takes c5, and now bishop to e2 to defend uh, the f pawn. Uh, so the position has opened up a bit, and that definitely helps Tal's bishops. Black, the black king is still in the middle of the board, and uh, Tal, in talking about this game, said that this was insufficient on its own to win or survive this position, but at least things were beginning to move in his direction. Uh, the opening wasn't great, but he's beginning to outplay Botvinnik over the board. Bishop to e7 is played. Now king to b1, getting the king off of the dark square, which is the same color of, as his opponent's bishop, avoiding any potential tricky tactics later in the game. Queen to c7, preparing to castle long here. Rook to h1, hitting the knight, long castle, and then bishop to g3. Now the knight is threatened to be captured, so he has to move it. Knight to f5, and rook to h7. We see Tal is now getting some tactics. He's threatening rook takes f7, and black now responds with the passive rook to f8. An inconvenient square, but he has to defend that pawn. Bishop to f4. The idea here is to play bishop d3, take the knight on f5, and then play bishop to h6, kicking the rook away from f8 so he can then take the f7 pawn. Botvinnik says he's going to play queen to d8. That's how he deals with this. After bishop to d3, continuing that plan of bishop takes knight, followed by bishop to h6, he plays the move rook to h8. Modern computers show us the best move is actually c5, continuing with the attack on white's king. And after bishop takes b5, g5 hits the bishop, and after, say, the bishop retreats, uh, then c4, 
and now uh, the threat of queen to b6, bishop c5, the knight can come into d4 potentially, f uh, c3, uh, three, excuse me, black gets some nice counterplay. But instead, Botvinnik plays rook to h8, and it reduces the pressure, but now uh, white does get an equal position. If he takes on f7, that's not as good. Queen to e8, after queen to a5, queen takes f7, and Tal does not get enough of an attack here. Black can untangle. After queen takes a7, he can play rook to h7, and black's going to succeed in moving his king over to the queen side. For example, a4 trying to open things up, just bishop to d8, offering the exchange, and if he checks, then king to d7, and we can see he is beginning to uh, eventually escape from this position. So instead, tile plays rook takes rook, queen takes, and then queen to a5. So basically, he's got to generate enough pressure against Botvinnik's king, which is starting to look quite lonely, to compensate for these pawn structure weaknesses from the opening that are still there. They haven't gone away. They're still a big factor. Uh, if king to b7 to defend the a7 pawn, uh, then Tal can play bishop takes b5 with a demolition sacrifice. Cb5, and then this powerful move, bishop to d2, threatening to come into a5, and uh, this would end up being a drawn position. Uh, that's an equal uh, position. Black can survive, but he's not going to get mated. So instead, black plays the move queen to h1 check, king to a2, queen takes f3, of course, hitting this bishop at f4. Tal ignores that and plays queen to a6 check, king to b8, and now queen takes c6. He's beginning to get some activity, uh, but he still uh, has some work to do. He's giving up this bishop on f4, and Botvinnik does take that. So he's, after bishop to b5, what he's hoping is he has enough activity with the queen and bishop to at least create a perpetual check against black's king. Queen takes e5 from Botvinnik. Now, this isn't just about winning a pawn. It also allows his queen back to defend the position. Queen to e8 check is played. King to b7. And queen to c6 check is played. Now, a very interesting variation, very fascinating, is bishop to a6 check, giving up another minor piece. But after king takes bishop, queen to c6 check, king to a5. And it looks like the move b4 is devastating. The problem is black could sacrifice the bishop for the pawn, and that would prevent mate. So white could play c3 here. And again, the threat is b4 checkmate. He would be mated after the move b4 because of the queen controlling all of these squares. But black could play queen to e2, pinning the b-pawn, and then after queen to c7, king b5, queen b7, king a5, he would have a perpetual check in that variation. But instead, queen to c6 is played, and after king to b8, they decide on a draw as he will just play these moves uh, back and forth. And so Tal survived a very strange opening decision by using ingenuity, putting as much pressure on his opponent as possible, and being creative at every turn. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, historically important game from Tal, and uh, see you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.